We're at CPAC 2011 Conservative Political Action Conference, and again, we have our friend Tom Deweese with us this year. Tom, uh, you were good enough to bring me your brand new book. Uh, <laughs> I have not seen it before. It just came out last week. It did, yes. Yeah. It's Now Tell Me I Was Wrong, 15 Years of Unheralded Wisdom and Warnings in the Battle for the Republic. Uh, this is a, a compilation of your writings for the last uh, 15 years. It's, Some a, of them, so. it's a collection of articles. Uh, you know, we, we have people who are so discontent right now with policies that are taking place, and uh, a lot of people don't understand what was the root of that, why. And uh, a lot of the articles that I wrote about over the last 15 years on issues like school to work and goals 2000, the total retransformation of our of our school system, uh, of course, sustainable development and Agenda 21, uh, United Nations global governance, illegal immigration, uh, all, you know, the, the radical environment, all these things uh, were things we were writing about then. And I believe that are really at the root now that, the, that those policies are being implemented are at the root of, of the discontent. And uh, so this kind of is, is like a history uh, showing where that was that was coming from and, and, and where they came from and who was the perp who, were, who were the perpetrators of it. And uh, of course, while I, when I was writing it, people were either ignoring it or saying I was crazy. And so hence the title, Now Tell Me I Was Wrong. I, I know the feeling. And <laughs> thanks so much for the, for the book. Now you are the president and founder of the American Policy Center. And uh, tell us briefly about that. First of all, where are you located? We're in Warrenton, Virginia, which is about 30 some miles outside of DC. And uh, we work on issues of property rights, personal privacy rights, national sovereignty issues, uh, and education. And uh, we have our action alert system called Sledgehammer that we put out uh, by email for free when uh, we something's happening you know, hot on Capitol Hill or other places. Now, uh, your group, American Policy Center, is uh, www.apc.org? No, it's AmericanPolicy.org. AmericanPolicy.org, mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Uh, and uh, they can get the Deweese Report there. Yes, we also have DeweeseReport.com, so okay. either either place you can, uh, can get it. Now, uh, there are, you, your interests cover a wide swath of what's happening in America and in society and politics and policy and whatnot. What are some of the key issues that you're focused on? Now? Well, we're almost exclusively focused right now on the issue of Agenda 21 and sustainable development. Uh, this is something, as we said, you know, the 1992 Earth Summit, where this came from, uh, and now being slowly, has been slowly implemented in almost every community in the country, now rapidly being implemented in, in all those communities. And now, after 15 years of, of trying to warn people about what this was about, people are beginning to see that something is wrong, that this is a policy, a lot of people think it's, it's a policy of conservation and environmental protection, and that's how it's sold. But in fact, uh, when you look at all the aspects of it, the social equity aspect, social justice, covers every aspect of our lives, uh, from how our communities are developed to what you can do in your own home to population control. Let's back up so. for a minute, because you mentioned Agenda 21. Mm -hmm. This is a United Nations program that came out of the Earth Summit Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and as we discussed this before, back at the time when I was there in Rio, at the Earth Summit, I came back and I was telling people, look, this is crazy. We're, they're going to try to uh, micromanage every aspect of our lives and our communities. Uh, people said, well, that, well, that's the United Nations. They're crazy. They're a bunch of uh, loons. But uh, 20 years later now, almost 2012 will be 20 years, uh, we are seeing this actually implemented. Uh, it isn't actually the United Nations uh, banner that's flying over these things. How does this work? In local well, in fact, if you if you go into your city council and, and say you're implementing a United Nations program, that's when they all look at you like you have two heads and they, they escort you out the door and, and your city councilmen, your county commissioners will tell you, no, no, this is just a local thing that we're doing. We, we came up with this idea. Whereupon I usually ask the question, can you explain to me how your documents are verbatim to those in Singapore? You know, it's, uh, it, that is the, what they try to put forth. But in fact, uh, there are organizations who helped write Agenda 21. And probably the most prominent one is ICLE, the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, helped write Agenda 21. And now 
uh, your city councils uh, in over 600 American cities are paying dues to this organization to come in, set up software, set up uh, programs, train staff, put these programs in place, pure sustainable development uh, from Agenda 21. And uh, again, they are using the excuse that this is just environmental protection. We're, we're looking at ways to cut our carbon footprint so that we can you know, cut energy use, cut uh, the, the building materials that are used. Recycle, that's reuse, recycle, recycle, all that, yeah. And uh, in fact, if you look at the sustainableist literature, if you look at what they say they are doing, uh, the, again, I go back to the social equity issue here, and I, and, I, and I emphasize this because people miss this. If you don't understand the social justice aspect of it, then you don't understand sustainable development. And the environmental part is the excuse. This is the meat of the problem. Uh, and if you look at their literature, and I mean, Karl Marx coined the term social justice. What more do you need to know about the policies being implemented? But uh, we've said for several years that sustainable development is the root of almost every issue that we're fighting. And to, to prove that, take a look at their literature where they talk about it is a social injustice for a nation to have borders, to have a sovereign nation. Well, why does the federal government not close the borders? Why are we having this illegal immigration problem? Because of the policies of Agenda 21 and sustainable development for, for a major part of it. Uh, Migration so that, is a social justice right. Yes, it's, so. it's their right to move in wherever they want to move, and, and uh, we have to let that happen. Of course, that goes clear into the global governance, uh, one world, you know, the whole whole ball of wax. It's all the same, you know, all interconnected with that. But uh, if you miss that part of it, uh, smart growth, which is a part of uh, sustainable development. You hear this talked about. If you're sitting in your car somewhere uh, in a traffic jam and somebody's on the radio talking about smart growth and how we want to get people out of their cars and reduce traffic and have uh, light rail trains and public transportation, you might think that sounds like a pretty good idea. What they've done, what they do with, with uh, smart growth is they draw a circle, basically, a wall around your community and they say, uh, no, there'll be no development outside of this urban sprawl, they say disdainfully. Uh, but in fact, what they've done, as soon as they put that wall around, is they have created an artificial shortage of property. And that means that property costs skyrocket. It also means that uh, you've got to control the population if you have so much land. And, uh, and so that goes right into that. And how do they control the population? You know, you can just use your imagination about how to so do that. This is a, is a, has a huge impact on property rights, on, be, on being able to do anything with yeah. your property. If you're, whether it's rural or semi-rural or undeveloped or developed, uh, that impacts it. Along with that, uh, we have the universal building codes that they're putting in that are going to have uh, various energy components and environment have to be built, new buildings built with certain uh, so-called recycled and environmentally approved uh, uh, components, things of that. How is that affecting? Uh, the, the shorthand version is that everything associated with sustainable development means higher costs and shortages. Uh, they continue to talk about sacrifice, that we need to sacrifice our overuse of energy, that you should take colder showers, that your home should be colder in the winter. And to in enforce that, they are beginning to uh, install these smart meters. They do uh, a, um, uh, an analysis of your uh, home and find out what your energy use is. And they will tell you that to meet the standards that the community has set, that you need to get a new roof or new windows or new energy efficient uh, appliances or something like this in order to comply. And they put the smart meters in, which control the use of your, uh, whether you can turn up your thermostat or not, control whether you can take a cold shower or a warm shower, and uh, all that comes together. In Oakland, California, where they uh, have implemented this, they have uh, estimated that the average cost to the homeowner in Oakland, California, to implement these policies and comply is about $35,000 per home. And if you don't comply, what happens? They always tell you all this is voluntary, but either you will be fined 
or you will uh, not be able to sell your home if, uh, uh, if you don't comply. And uh, so these kind of controls over every aspect of your life, and you look at the reason why. We're told it's because we've got to cut our carbon footprint. We've got to, it's because of climate change, global warming. And you know, if people are paying attention, over the last year, the global warming uh, behemoth has been so discredited. It's melted down. It's, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, the massive meltdown that they've had with it. There's no credibility to it at all, but yet communities are still trying to implement these programs based on that as the excuse. The fact of the matter is we don't have an energy shortage. We don't have a need to cut back on all of our carbon footprint and our energy use. Uh, we are having an artificial energy shortage because everything that the, the government is pushing is alternative energy, windmills and solar panels and, and the like, and you know, they cover like one or two percent of our energy needs. We're not developing new real energy needs or you know, drilling our own oil. They always use the excuse, well, we've got to cut our dependence on foreign oil. Well, I agree with that, but you can't do it with windmills and solar panels. You have to have American oil to drill, but they're not doing that, so they're creating artificial shortages and, and only, higher prices. And not only oil, but even uh, had uh, John Felmy of American Petroleum Institute in here today. Uh, we were discussing how natural gas, for instance, which had, was the darling of the environmentalists uh, 15 years ago. They wanted to get rid of oil and diesel and go natural gas. Now they've flipped and they're against natural gas, too. Uh, they're opposed to coal. Uh, they said earlier, well, we got to get away from dirty coal, we want clean coal. Now they're against clean coal. They say there's no such thing as clean coal. <laughs> they were against uh, uh, nuclear power. Now some of them are for nuclear power, but not the nuclear power we have now, some futuristic uh, fourth generation nuclear power. So it's always about limiting energy, limiting American productivity and independence, always making us more and more vulnerable. And, and all, all of that just shows, just what you've just recited there. This is nothing about protecting the environment. It is nothing about uh, alternative energy and that sort of thing. It is about top-down control with a political agenda. and. It's the catch-22. No matter what you try to do, there's always a reason you can't do that. And so, uh, you know, what it all boils down to is some sort of government control, some sort of government program, uh, and you lose. The uh, uh, communities locally that are fighting this, uh, do you see any around the country where they're making some progress? This is the exciting part. After 15 or so years of fighting this thing, as, as you well know, a, a lonely battle with, uh, you know, people ship you tin foil hats in the mail, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, it is star I have never seen anything like what's happened in the last year uh, with the Tea Party movement, with others. It, they're catching on. They're figuring it out. There's enough going on in the communities that people can see it now. And uh, we have uh, a very privileged to be working with a county commissioner in Carroll County, Maryland. He's the politician we've been looking for for all these years. He has an entire council, all five of them, uh, that are on board to fight this stuff. The first thing they did was they voted to shut down the Sustainable Development Office in the county. They bought out the contract of the guy they hired to uh, run it, got him out of there. Then the next thing they did was stop the contract with ICLEI so they're not paying them dues anymore, running them out of town. And then now they're ready to take on the EPA and uh, all of its dire water controls that they're, they're working to put in place. And uh, this is a guy who understands what he's dealing with and, and the need to get this message out to county commissioners across the country. And I'm working with him to create uh, uh, tools to videos and so forth to get out to every county commissioner in the country. I'm working with people all over the country. The phone will not stop ringing with people wanting more information and telling me what they're doing in their community. I'm traveling more, speaking more. It's the most they exciting are thing I've seen. starting to realize mm -hmm. where all of this is uh, mm -hmm. emanating from yeah. and where it is taking them. Yeah. Uh, one of the things uh, we have talked about in the past uh, is that uh, many people over the last uh, 10, 15 years have become uh, much more uh, leery of and uh, uh, concerned about 
and disapproving of the United Nations. They're beginning to realize that it isn't just the big brotherhood of all humanity, it's uh, that it really uh, is being built into a global government. And uh, if we're going to uh, uh, free ourselves from all of these programs that are being fastened upon us, whether it's Agenda 21 or the Global Warming Kyoto Protocol or its, its successor, uh, sustainable development and whatnot. It really gets back to the United Nations. Uh, we've been uh, pushing for many years to cut off all U.S. funds to the United Nations, for the U.S. to withdraw from the United Nations. Is that something that uh, you support? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We um, turned in uh, back during the Millennium Summit uh, on a news conference on Capitol Hill, we turned in three and a half skids, 500,000 petitions at the time, in support of Ron Paul's uh, bill to get us out of the UN. And uh, before that, we turned in another 500,000, and we're still collecting them. And uh, I, I think that is the most important issue of all, because you cut it off at the root, then the rest of the stuff would go away. Then the, the uh, one on uh, children and women and uh, labor and all of the other UN treaties, uh, all of those, the law of the sea, uh, then all of them are cut off at the same time. We don't have sure. to fight all those individuals. Sure, out. yeah. Get them, you know, get us out of it. Get them out of here, and uh, let's go back to sovereign nations and uh, honest trade and honest dealings with with other nations. You know, the, the, the whole thing was put together with the excuse that this was going to end wars and it'd be a place for countries to come and sit down and air their differences. And of course, you know, preaching to the choir here, you know that uh, that we've had more wars. And when we do have a war now with the United Nations involved, there's never an end to it. So it's always like now Korea is coming back to grab us. Forever. Sure, sure. Well, thanks so much for stopping by, Tom. This is his new book, Tom DeWeese. Now tell me I was wrong. And just out now this, uh, this week, uh, Tom DeWeese, president of the American Policy Center. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks.